Uh, good morning. Today we start, I think, with the, is the third lecture on equipment, both in a nano center of excellence. And today is, today's lecture, Professor Dragic will show you in the first half basics of focus iodine system, and then Jose Buch will introduce you, will demonstrate you how the microscope works. So, Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, now I have really a difficult task because previous lecture, my previous lecture was something from the experience of maybe 20 years or something like that. And this will be lecture with the experience again, something like 20, but not years, but days. <laughs> because the FIP or Focus IMD, this machine was installed maybe months ago, two months ago, and in this period there was two or three broken parts and, and malfunctioning valves and so on. But still, we have a very, very nice machine. It's the second in Slovenia, but with the, all attachments and possibilities and options, it's definitely the first one. It consists of the scanning electron microscope, which has the best performances, I think, in not just Slovenia, but slightly also around here. So let's start at the beginning. I will talk about FEI. This is company, Helios NanoLab 650. This is a model of this. Dual beam, why dual beam? Because indeed we have electrons and ions. So two columns, two beams. That is bought in the frame of the center of excellence in nanoscience and nanotechnology. Using FIP you can do, okay, maybe not everything, but a lot of things. You can build something. This is the University College of London. I count the pillows, there are not so many, but still, the resemblance is quite quite good. I do not understand that one here. It must be something with Japanese sense of humor. This made a Japanese guy. And those fans of Star Trek, maybe not ladies, but boys, perhaps. This is the smallest enterprise ship. I mentioned it's somewhere around. Five, five microns. And here are two examples of not just playing around with FIP, but indeed with the device that worked. This is the Cornell University, and those results are relatively old, maybe 15 years. Uh, they make a guitar. Any gu guitar player here? It's a special, special type. Can you, can you? Comment a little bit which type of guitar is this? Okay, I forgot. Because the, the design and the morphology of this guitar, it's uh, really, I don't know, who played on this guitar. But it has strings. And those strings vibrate if you put the laser beam on. Because the frequencies are somehow combined. <coughs> and also, this. Xylophone, or, or I would say nanophone, because xylo is something with, with uh, wood. This is something with nano materials. So it's really a machine that can do a lot of things. And the main idea is, of course, that with fine movements, fine tunings, you can do, you can, you can sculpture the things you want to do. So you have, you have iron beams, just traveling around on your surface and digging a hole. <coughs> okay, if you increase the energy, it's not the artistic work anymore, it's uh, more powerful. And of course you can increase even more. And I think that if we put the complete all energy and current on our FIP, something like that. You can really destroy your sample and perform really, really big holes inside. But 
let's see what we will talking about today. Just a few facts about instrumentation, detectors, ion column, ion source, gas injector system, so on. Some basics about interaction of ions and solid material, some, and some application. And of course this most interesting part will be at the end, when you are all welcome to join colleague Jozef, which will demonstrate the, the, the thing that I will explain, explain previously, and on the side, beside the microscope. So the ion source, we have to produce ions. Those ions should have relatively high energy, so it should be heavy. And normally, nowadays, are used gallium. Why gallium? Because gallium is a funny, funny metal. It has melting point very, very low. Something around, I think, 30, 30 degrees centigrade. So you need really small amount of energy to make it liquid. And this is the basic idea of the source. You have a very, very sharp tip. At the end, it's so-called, physicists would maybe know better, so-called Taylor cone. And at the end, you apply some voltage, high voltage, in the range of 1 to 10 kilovolts. And those atoms at the top of this cone are ionized. They lose electrons. They became the gallium plus, and you just accelerate those ions down to the current. And this is the practical, practical um, ion source from, from FEI. The lifetime of such ion source is somewhere around 1,000 hours, 1,200 hours. So if you use extensively this machine, it should be changed twice per year, for instance, once, once to twice per year. Schematically, again, this uh, source, uh, this is so-called liquid metal ion source. There are also other sources. The system or, or, or the machines, the FIP first, FIP is first uh, mentioned or practically, practically designed somewhere in the late 70s, 76, 78. In 80s, there was, you could uh, already bought some relatively good machines, and nowadays they are really really perfect with high resolution and so on. And this is the, the, the practical the ion column, where you have this liquid metal ion source, this extractor cap, so you extract the, the ions from, from that tip. You have first lens, you have aperture, you have some quadrupoles and octopoles here, I will explain later on why we do need them some blanking plates so that we can blank the beam. We do not want to have a beam, we just blank, we just uh, curve the beam somewhere here. And we have second lens. First lens, the function of first lens to make beam parallel and the second lens to make beam focused. And of course this focus should be on the center. That's all. Lenses. In transmission electron microscope and scanning electron microscope, if you remember, the lenses are electromagnetical. So we have some uh, current running through, the, through the, uh, this electromagnetic lens, magnetic field inside, the electrons are trying to spin around and so on. Here, because we have much higher mass than the electron, we are using the electrostatic or, or, or electrical. So we have just electrical field and the positive, of course, ion will curve uh, the, the trajectory will pertain to the negative, negative electron. This is more in detail, such a column, but practically, practically the same, it's just nicely, nicely shown. We have some additional apertures, it depends on what current of the ions we want to have here. As I said before, the first, the first lens should make parallel beam and the octopole here is just, uh, again, some uh, electrostatic lenses but divided in, in eight segments where we 
where we change or where we improve the, the stigmatism so that we really, at the end, we should have really focus nice in the in, um, nice circle around it, around the beam. And the lower part, lower octopole, is needed for just scanning. So scanning means this beam is just performing lines, and scanning in that direction. As an integral part of the Iron column normally is also the multi-channel multi uh, plate which is used as a detector, a detector for the, getting the signal from, from our sample. So, <clears throat> just a brief explanation of the detectors. Maybe I, I will start or just mention the so-called ET detector, Everhard Torni, just some name. Uh, it originated from scanning electron microscopy. Just a combination of Faraday cage, of some scintillator, light guide, and photomultiplier. We collect electrons from all around here with this positively, positively charged Faraday cup. Those electrons are, are, are striking, striking some scintillator. That means material that emit light. Electron comes in, out goes light in visible, visible spectrum. Uh, normally, nowadays, they are used yak, so yttrium, yttrium aluminium garment material. Then we need some piece of plastic, optically very, very good, light guide, because the function of this is to, to suppress the electrons. Maybe some electrons could pass this scintillator, uh, not to ruin the photomultiplier, because one high energetic electrons could destroy your photomultiplier. Because it's a very, very sensitive piece of, the, of uh, this detector. And this light that is emitted in, in uh, this part here, the scintillator is just multiplied with this photomultiplier. And at the end, we get the signal. If we have a small amount of electrons here, the signal will be low. If we have a large amount of electrons, the signal will be high. That's the whole idea. Another idea or another possibility is so-called multi-channel plates, where this is just schematically drawn. We have some kind of channels, again, some potential, so that charged particles, so not just electrons, but also the ions, could be detected with, this, with these detectors. We just change, switch the switch the polarity. If you want to <coughs> attract electrons, we need plus. If you want to attract the, the, the ions, positively charged ions, we need, we need minus. Here, here is the practical such uh, detector. And this is the scheme of one channel. It's a gradient of the voltage around here. And using one quant of primary radiation, we end with a lot of, lot of electrons. And because this is a parallel channel, you see this one here, the inside part, uh, the, the sensitivity of such detectors could be, could be relatively high. So with that detector, ET, we can measure just electrons, and with that one we can measure simultaneously or depending on the voltage, is it plus or minus, we can measure electrons or ions. Okay, we have, <coughs> in this microscope, we have another possibility, and this is so-called scanning transmission node, so that very, very thin samples, samples like prepared for the transmission electron microscope, the special, special sample holder, this is the path of the electrons, and this is retractable, so when we need it, we put it in, when we do not need it, we put it out, detector for for, for uh, electrons. And here's the one example of bright field and dark field imaging with, with uh, such, type of, such type of detectors. What, what is characteristic? Definitely in bright field, the hole, where there is no sample, is bright, and in dark field, is dark. In dark field, we are just collecting those electrons that are diffracted, diffracted due to different processes. I will not go into the detail about that. And here are two additional equipment, which is normally also connected with focus line beam. 
Uh, due to the lack of time, of course, uh, in this lecture I'm concentrating just on the ions. Because I think everybody already heard about electrons and scanning electron microscopy and so on. You're, most of you practically work with scanning electron microscopy, so I somehow <coughs> Imagine that it would be more interesting to, to, to talk about ion column, ions, and so on. So, another part of this complete system is gas inject injection system. Uh, this system ends with very, very tiny capillary, which is, I think, some 100 microns or something like that at the end, and uh, certain gas. It depends on the what type of material we want to use. It's coming out from here. Okay, it's not blowing, but the, the partial pressure, partial pressure here, I think it's at least two order of magnitude worse than, than around here. And why this use? This is used for the deposition. We will see later on how indeed we can we can perform this process. And we have also the micro manipulator. This is again very very complicated device which could be moved mechanical, okay, at the end we have mechanical movements uh, which is realized of course with, 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 uh, with piezo transducers and um, quite a complicated uh, computer supported uh, system. Uh, we can move this part, this very point of this micro manipulator in the range of few tens of, few tens of nanometers. Why is this used? We will also see uh, later on. So just like an example of this. So now, just briefly about the principle of the photocyte. We modify the surface using positively positively charged ions. In our case, gallium ions. Uh, there are some approaches nowadays for the last few years where also helium, it's a much more complicated machine, where helium ions are used and they can achieve also much better resolution than helium. But for normal work, still gallium is a lot of energy and can, you, can, you can proceed, or you can do your, your job uh, relatively quite quickly. So we have accelerated positive ions, gallium, and at the, at the surface we have few type of interaction. Elastic interaction, which is displacement, sputtering, defect formation, ion flotation, so on. And inelastic, energy is lost in that case where the secondary electrons are formed, secondary ions, X-ray, photons, and so on. As I showed before, if we move that beam, we can do surface pattern. We can, we can uh, put some patterns on the surface, we can draw something on the surface. So sputtering, sputtering is just moving or removal of the material by elastic collision between ions and target ions, power sample. And this process, for this process we need a few hundred electron volts of energy. Uh, typically, Focus ion beam works at 30 kilo electron volts, so there's a lot of lot of energy, but it could go down to one kilo or even less. I think power goes to 500. Still, we have enough energy to be on this this regime. It should be more than five kilo. And okay, this are not could be around one kilo. And sputtering occurs where collision cascade. Next slide, we will see example of such, such cascade. But what is important is that most ejected those atoms or ions, secondary ions, are just from the top few atomic layers. And this is, this is the idea of, if you remember, one method, since secondary ion mass spectroscopy, which is very, very, it's a surface technique, it's very, very sensitive just for the surface. And also the Detection limit is very, very low. A few atoms per I don't know, and you can detect it. Good, and this is the example of such collision cascade. So, one primary gallium, gallium ion comes to our surface, it 
move one atom from its position and of course change trajectory at some angle and still have some energy and move it another one and so on till the end in the end lost this one lost complete all energy and it's implanted it's there it's sitting there and you can determine it with energy dispersive x-ray uh, spectrometry there is high concentration of gallium in all materials that were cut using the paper. Cascade means that all other atoms or ions can do the same thing. And at the end, you might get some sputter species, sputter atoms, and some electrons. Secondary electrons and secondary, secondary ions. What is the depth? So, in scanning, if you remember, in scanning electron microscope, this uh, famous volume. So you might have here <coughs> five or, or even less, one nanometer sized electron beam. But if you are using 20 kilo electron volts of energy, at the end you will get a signal from two micrometers. Depends which type of signal. The worst resolution is X are X-rays, so we're here, slightly better are backscatter electrons, even better are secondary electrons, but still, doesn't matter the diameter of the incident electrons, you always have much, much larger, larger interaction volume. And <coughs> this interaction volume is, of course, also very, very important and interesting here. So, these are some calculations, uh, Monte Carlo calculation of one trajectory of just one gallium atom. We goes from here with the surface up to here, which is uh, 50 nano, something like 20, 25 nanometers. And these are the complete cascade. So, not just the gallium, but also the intrinsic material, intrinsic ion that are inside. If you multiply this with, I don't know, a few, few tens, 100 for instance, we see that the estimated volume where our information comes or when we, where we damage our material is still somewhere in the order of 20, 30, 50 nanometers. It's not so bad. Using 30 kilo, kilo, kilowatts. If we would lower the energy, also this volume would be much, much smaller. <coughs> or if we change the material. That was aluminium, and now we have gold. And we see that this interaction volume is much smaller, 20, in, in the similar case. So what could be also interesting is the effect of energy and angle on the projected range of this volume that interacts. And we can see here for, for gallium, and as a material that we use for, for sputtering color, Examination is silicon, uh, as that one here. So at 30 kilo electron volts, it's also in the tower microscope, which is the maximum energy, we are somewhere around 25 up to 30 using again silicon. So in gold it will be something like that, in, in lower Z material, slightly, slightly larger. But if we lower the energy, also, this interaction volume would be much, much more. Why is this important? Imagine that you want to prepare TEM, means for transmission electron microscope, a lamella assembly. So if you use the high energy electrons, you will end with the material that suffered somehow, could be destroyed, could be, could it be uh, amorphized in the range of 20 nanometers. It's much too much. Mm -hmm. For transmission electron microscope, maybe we can survive with one, two, three nanometers maximum. So we should be in that range here. Definitely below five, five keV, maybe on two, three, or one. Angle of incidence, that means just the angle with, between the sample and 90 degrees, 180. Of course, it's parallel, does not mean okay, something like that, but this angle and the sputtering yield. What does it mean, sputtering yield? You can just imagine 
how much atom you move with one with one um, ion. And we see that the maximum is some, something like that. Of course, at 90 degrees, again, it's uh, lowering down. But the maximum is here around 70, 80 degrees of the angle. And again, depends on the <coughs> sputtering yield of different material. Silicon is very low, and with zinc, it's, it's much, much uh, higher. So that the uh, rule of thumb means one nanometer of destroyed area, of amorphous area, corresponds practically to one kilo, kilo electron volt, which is, which is really true. Okay, now let's go to some parameters that are important for imaging. Yield of secondary electrons depends on the material. Okay, here we can have secondary electron yield, it's gamma, and it's that one for different energies. Let's, let's take this one, 30 kilo electron volts. And we see that the yield is lowering when the atomic number is increasing. So for the low Z material, oxygen, carbon, and so on, it will be much, much higher production of secondary electrons than for the high material. This is good information. Why? Because we can most probably easily see oxide layer on some grain boundaries. We will see the example later on. At the same time, spattering here, that means how much ions, secondary ions we are producing, it's, uh, it's what is, it's why it's that one here. And this one is rising. It's higher if the Z gets higher. So, taking into account those two, two quantities, we can imagine what type of images or what type of contrast we should use to get the information that we, that we want. And of course, the penetration depth, we have already said, <coughs> it's relatively, relatively low. Here are some examples on what else influence on the signal, on the intensity of the signal. The influence of the orientation, crystal orientation, it's very important. Here is one so-called channeling effect. What does it mean? If you have the irritation, okay, the gallium are coming from that part, from up to down, and if you have here some kind of channels, it can, this gallium can penetrate quite, quite deeply inside the material. If you have some orientation, but this is enough just to, to tilt the, your sample, your crystal, for 45 degrees. In one case you have channeling, in that case you have them. Depends on the structure, of course, and on the tilt of your sample. For instance, this one here, you have no channeling, that means that most, most of gallium ions are interactive matter, and there are a lot of, lot of uh, more signal, or secondary ion, or secondary electrons. It's also important the Z, or the, 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 the atomic, atomic number. So if you have heavier elements, gold, platinum, comparing to aluminium or <coughs> carbon and so on, at higher Z materials we will have higher signals. And also it's important the angle, what we explained before, this function is laser, if in this part, in this part, the angle could be practically 90, and this part is zero. So, from this part, we'll get more information, more electrons and ions, than from that part here. <coughs> Once more, this is a study how the, this, this is just the electron channeling, how this channeling influences the yield. Yield of, in this case, now we have gold, gold atoms, and gallium ions. And these are the orientation of this gold. It's in gold is cubic. And in one case, this is 001, this is that. We have relatively low yield, low signal. Why? Due to channeling. Because those gallium can penetrate inside and they do not produce secondary ions, secondary electrons at the surface where, can we, where we can measure. 
And when we orient this in this range where practically no channeling can occur, the yield of the number, number of atoms, secondary ions, which are produced are much higher. Again, it's lower in some specific orientations, in specific zone axes. And the highest is around here, uh, where practically no, no channel is, is uh, present in this material. And again here, this is 1, 1, 0. Oh, means from here, we went to that position, just 45 degrees. And 45 degrees, we change, change the orientation of our, of our crystal, and we get much, much, much different signal, much different yield. It means much different thing. But can, can this be used um, for some application? Yeah. This is so-called channeling. If you have channeling, the signal is dark because there are no, not much electrons and ions, and here is no channeling. And in that case, you can see every grain, it has its own brightness, its own contrast. This means that this one has no channeling and this one has very, very high channel. And even you can see that the depth of the penetration efficiency is different due to this channel. You might get very nice images using this um, channeling. And here's some example. This is, these are electrons, normally secondary electrons. And these are ion-induced secondary electrons. In both cases, you measure the electrons, but in that case, you also use electrons for the signal, and here you use, you use ions, but measure electrons. And you see really nice, nice images of the two channels. Okay, if I just uh, repeat once more, we have different detectors, and we have different imaging modes using these detectors, and all those modes depends on this basic physics that I, I showed you in the last, <coughs> last few transparencies. There are also possibility to put inside such a machine a nice mass spectrometer, uh, spectrometer as I said before, and to get a really, really good analytical machine. Okay, how we can use this uh, focus time beam? Three basic basic um, areas that we are using, it's imaging, etching, and the position. Imaging, we already described what type of signals and what is the influence of different parameters on the, on the signal. We use this multi-channel plate as a detector and we image the surface. We can increase the current of beams, of, of, ion, of ions, ion beam, and we can drill a hole. This is etching. We can deep etch the material. Or we can put some gas which decomposed under the beam and decomposed in some metallic thin film, positive thin film, and these are just the volatile organic remainings of this reaction. reaction Maybe just uh, some examples of all these uh, different areas. We can perform a regular cross-section nice and this structure, we just dig a hole here and using electrons or ions we can see nice images. Uh, of course this is stolen from the internet, from the website of the factory, FEI, and this is made, made here at the institute uh, this last time, one month or two months. Not just imaging, we can also do some tomography or 3D reconstruction. We can cut a layer, like here, we can identify as a, as a signal, as an image, or even using x-rays we can determine the chemical composition. Then we slice the way another slice and another slice, we get so-called such data cubes from every such a slice, and at the end we can reconstruct, reconstruct the three-dimensional three -dimensional, uh, real, real center here like the distribution of, I think it was copper, copper and iron, or aluminum, something like that. This is one example. Example of the deposition. Here is just one, one schematic more. So, first we deposit or absorb, 
absorb the gas molecules, which contain some platinum iron, uh, I'm sorry, platinum gold, tungsten, and so on, uh, and some organic organic radicals around. They are in the gas form using focused ions or even electrons. We decompose this material and this tungsten, or platinum or gold remains at the top of our sample and those um, species that are volatile and, and made due to this decomposition just goes, goes in, the, go in the vacuum system. Some example of the deposition of electrons. Um, some nanotube, four point measuring, those lines of platinum were deposited. Um, this is just the, the, the zoom of this part here. These are some large elect electrodes that we can use for measuring. Uh, Roger will show you his own experiment. He was doing, doing most of his deposition experiments uh, in the last, last month. Again, one such example of, of uh, <coughs> deposition. We can even build some nano actuators or some nano nano devices like this absolute pressure pressure sensor, which is just deposited in such archived way. So we end here. We have some hole with fixed fixed pressure down here, and depending on the outside pressure, this material is compressing or elevating and measuring. I don't know optical properties or electrical properties, we can measure, measure the, the pressure inside that. And as the last <coughs> example, what focus time beams could be very useful, is the transmission electron microscope sample preparation. Those of you that are dealing with transmission electron microscope, you know how important it is to get good, nice samples. Without sample, you can do nothing. And nowadays the problem is to prepare a sample at a specific area. It's practically impossible because you are using techniques that you are within plus minus few millimeters. But if you want to exactly make a sample from this part, some other parts, you can use them. Okay, I can show you a movie. And it's better. Hope it will work. Yeah. I do okay. So the first act is the deposition of platinum. You see? The platinum is deposited. Of course the time scale here is much much uh, exaggerated. You need maybe a few minutes for this one. So you peel up a uh, part of platinum and then you drill a hole here. You turn around a sample, drill a hole around here. Okay. So you end with such very, very roughly made lamella. You cut it here and there. You see? It just It's fixed just in this part. This is platinum. You can use then fine thinning, fine milling, on this part, on another part. You can thin it. You can not not down to extreme because this next part could resemble on Greek tragedy because this is the most critical part. You see the size of this but it's very very small, this is micro manipulated. And you should bring this micro manipulated just few tens of tens of hundreds of nanometers and you weld it here, you cut it there, and you get lamella. Very easy, huh? <laughs> we did not, yet we did not get any, any good lamella. So, and how long does it take to... One hour? Only. Yeah, depends on... Okay, and then, of course, you have to fix this lamella somewhere. You have some special, special uh, sample holders. Fix it inside. Again, the next the next step very crucial to put this lamella here. And this here, you see, this big, big, big tube uh, is this gas system, this uh, gas injection system. 
where you will put again some small part of platinum. Here, here you cut there, and you have you have lamella fixed on the TM center folder. Of course, this lamella is still very thick, very thick, and with very very uh, large amount of amorphous amorphous material. Okay, in the maybe the final or semi-final act. Now you have to really do fine thinning of your lamella. Still, I would say it's maybe something like two microns, definitely too thick. But if you can go down to 50, 70 nanometers, maybe like this one here, and especially again using low energy so that you will not end with amorphous lamella at the end. You see here, some areas are really, really thin. And that's it, the end of the happy end. Okay, but of course the, the company or the producers of it are saying no problem, one hour, two hours. You can overnight. You can do five to ten samples. Okay, then you speak with uh, really guys that are doing fib, that are preparing. They say, okay, if you prepare one good lamella per day, this is really you're really experienced. So it depends on what you want because you can end with such type of uh, transmission electron microscope sample. This is five nanometer. That means here is twenty. 20 nanometers of amorphous layer using 30 kilo electron volts. You can end with something like 2, with 5, or even practically without a very, very small amount of, of amorphous inside uh, at the top of your, your sample. So you can imagine that this is what you want, or even, even better. Okay, I think I came to the end. This is our microscope or our dual beam, our FIP, during the installation, so not everything is uh, finished yet. At the moment, it's, uh, we, we removed some nice parts of the machine because we have some problems with valves and we have to, to manually open and close valves, but it will be definitely a complicated machine and hopefully it will be fixed in next weeks, I hope still this year. These are just briefly the specifications, if somebody is interested, but you can find this on, on, on the internet. Electron beam, this is the scanning electron microscope, it's really good resolution. Also at one kilovolt, it's below one nanometer. And this is due to the due to the monochromator. So this machine, this color has monochromator at the top just below the uh, electron source, which even improves the resolution at lower energies. Ranges are from 20 volts to 30 kilovolts. We are still talking about electron beam. And the landing voltages for electron beam 20 to 30, and for ion beam half to 30 kiloelectron volts. Probe current. You see, it's uh, from 0 0.8 picoamperes to 26 nanoamperes. It's really huge range of the electron, also of the ion beam. So in that case, you are really polishing and using very, very artistic approach. And in that case, you are using dynamite, or this big, big cranes. Uh, we have four different gas injection systems. We can deposit platinum. Insulator, which is based on silica, silicium oxide, gold, and we also have enhanced etching using iodine, so that we can improve etching in the fact of 10 or 20, just due, due to chemical reaction of the surface atom with iodine. Uh, of course, we have this in situ sample lift out, charge neutralizer. And the resolution for ion beam is around 4, depends on how you measure. 2.5 nanometers, comparing to that is much worse, but still you can get nice images to modification of up to 20,000, 50,000. We have these types of detectors. 
Vexcatel secondary ET detector, infrared camera. We have this eyes detector for the detector for, for the ions, retractable detector for, for uh, right field, dark field, for s s scanning transmission electron microscopy, and beam current current measurement. We have also some special software like Auto TM. So you just press the button and he in one or two hours he will make complete his self automatically uh, lamella. Uh, in reality that it means that after five minutes it stopped working because there's some problem corrupted something and so on. So we are of course if you do this on uniform ideal sample like surface of the silicon it could be done. But if you're using the practical sample with a lot of pores some other features there then the this automatically um, recognition system somehow fails. You have to do it manually, but no problem. You can put five samples inside, one, two, three, four, five, also in the middle. It's a very huge stage chamber. And this is the image from the part of the sample. This is electron column, ion column, one detector, another detector, third, this is the EDS system. Um, you can imagine a lot of this, lot of this uh, very tiny, tiny uh, system for gas injection and micromanipulators should be somewhere like here. And those things are moving in and out. And if you, I mean, it's very, very easy to destroy this inner part of the FIP relatively very, very quickly could be quite, quite expensive and so on. So if you will work on this machine, it's really very important to follow the procedures, to, to be very careful, because this is not like a computer. You can practically do no harm. Just reset it. Uh, some these mechanical parts could be, could be quite, quite uh, problematic. Some of our work, the set Joja did some electrical measurements on what was this molybdenum and nitrate, or I guess a nanotube. They performed some very funny structure. We play a little bit with uh, lamella. Okay, we end at that part. It stopped already automatically. It stopped after that. You see this this uh, very rough surface of our our sample. Okay, you know the Devil's Tower in, in I think it's Wyoming. Uh, yeah, they succeeded. Very, very. But this one is very very nice for climbing, and I guess they try to do more polish this. But experience and experience will will help in all these areas. Okay, thank you for your attention, and to be continued. Continued. It means when we learned a lot of more, when we had much more experience, then I guess we can also um, do another lecture or another presentation on what it could be done. I think it could be done much more than I described. And so now you are welcome, invited to join Roger to uh, show you the for the next, next hour.